live and all. You're live. You're live. Thank you. This is the S54 Committee of Conference. Um, and uh, today the House does not have a counter proposal to present to the Senate. Um, we are working on one. Um, we've had some productive actions, um, but because a number of committees in the House worked on S54, um, we need to have a couple more conversations before we can present a counter proposal. Um, but I thought it'd be productive to meet today because there's um, a couple of issues that, that we need to address. Um, um, Stephanie Barrett and Graham Campbell are here to talk about the tax provisions in S54 and their, their impact. Um, and Michael Grady's here to help with the agricultural section, which I know you want to have some discussion about. And I am happy to discuss the potency limits um, that, are, that the House put into S54. Um, but I thought we would start with Stephanie um, and Graham on the tax. Before we do that, implementation. Sure. Will they be going over both the Senate and the House versions in taxes or just the House version? I think they'll make a comparison. No, Janet? Well, they're going to talk about what the Senate put on the table last week. Oh, okay. <laughs> they did an analysis of how that would work. Okay. Janet? Um, could, um, I, I don't know if it's the, if Stephanie and um, Graham are the right people to actually talk about in connection with the taxes, the the fee issue, somebody needs to explain to me the fee issue and how that's going to, what that means, what the fees are, who's going to set them, and what they're going to generate and how they're going to generate. So I don't know if it's Stephanie and Graham or not, but at some point, I'd like that discussion. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, Andrea just posted, is that right, Andrea? Peggy is posting the documents to the um, House GovOps page now from Graham. Okay. I can email those to everyone as well. Would people prefer to get them by email? Yes, I would. Okay, I will email those to you right now. And they are also posted on the House GovOps page right now. Make sure everybody has the documents. Which one are we going to start with? The um, conference estimates or the fund impact summary? Uh, I think you're muted, Graham. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. I don't. Ha I have not received the document yet. I know. I'm just trying to figure out which one we'll start with, and we won't start okay. until you have them, Dick. Okay. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? No. I'm quiet. Now is this any better? No. Echo. Okay. Um, I'm gonna switch to my iPad and I will be right back, I think, to make this easier. <coughs> I've received the documents. Did you get them? Good. I know. Okay. Okay. Are we starting with the fund summary? Um, that's what we're asking Graham and he, um, had to switch machines. You can hear me now, apparently. Yes, better. Um, can Let's see if we can hear now? Graham. That's yes. Better. That's better. OK, good. Um, do all the conferees have the, the documents that's that I sent over. Um, I think, Stephanie, I don't know about you, but I think it maybe might be better to start with just the revenue estimates and then you can sort of um, overview the, the, the sure, impact sure. fund. Yeah. Yeah. All right, great. So I think the first document we'll be looking at is entitled, um, I'm not quite sure how Andrew, what, what's entitled on the website, but it, I sent a document called S54 Conference Revenues, August 
24th, I think is what it's entitled. <clears throat> I have one that says draft S54 conference. Yeah, S yeah, proposal. that's the one. Okay. okay. Yeah, and it still has draft on there. It should probably not at this point. We were When I was working with Stephanie, I had draft on this just to, um, in case anything changed. Um, but this is essentially the updated revenue estimates based upon what was discussed um, last Monday, what the Senate proposed. Um, and just an overview of that proposal is that <clears throat> there was a, an excise tax, a state excise tax of 14%, although in reality, what it broke out to was a 12% uh, excise tax that would go to the state revenue and then um, 2% of that 14%, so or 200 basis points would go to um, localities. So essentially 12% of the excise, uh, like 12% tax for the state and 2% for the localities. Um, and after, um, I see, I, I have a quick question. Are we still using the same revenue projections as far as gross income? And this is just a breakdown from that, or has the, have those numbers changed since last meeting? The, the taxable base hasn't really changed. Um, okay. The, um, because this is the taxable base that I had last week for the house version would be the same as this one, roughly, because it's the same timeline and the same it has the, the integrated licenses for medical dispensaries. So the taxable base yeah. is the same for, as the house proposal, but the rates are different and how it's divvied okay, up great. is different. So, Sorry. Graham, <laughs> Graham, could you, for the um, benefit of those people watching, give an explanation of what basis points are? Absolutely. Um, so basis points are sort of the, um, another way of describing percentages, um, 100 basis points means 1%. So um, whenever, so 14% would actually end up being um, 1400 basis points. And so um, to make this a little bit clear, I described this as taking 200 basis points for the locality. So what that means is that you'll have a starting point of 14% excise tax and 2% of that 14%. Um, will go to localities. Two, 200 basis points means 2%. Um, it's just a little bit, I, I found it a little bit clearer to understand um, when we described it this way because rather than sort of thinking about 2% of the revenue pot, um, you take two, 200 basis points off of the 14% of excise tax and that's what goes to the localities. There was some confusion in the, in the committee last week about what exactly that meant. So um, 200 basis points means 2% of the 14%. Um, so after those, those 200 basis points are carved out of the 14% excise tax, so we have the remaining 12% excise tax, that all that money would go to the state. After that, those two basis, 200 basis points are carved out, 30% of that money would go to a substance misuse and prevention fund and 70% would be allocated to the general fund. And then this maybe touches on um, Senator White's issue from the beginning. Um, we have state fees still in the bill and those are to be determined by the Cannabis Control Board sometime in fiscal year 21 or 22. Um, and I believe the language is still the same that the, the, the fees should be set at a level roughly equivalent to um, Massachusetts level, which is about five hundred to six hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year worth of revenue. Can I can ask I a question? Yeah, Graham, can you tell me what the fees are? I mean, I I, I don't understand what it means by fees. What is it a fee on? Is it a an added fee on the permit? Is it an added fee on just the establishment? Is what, what kind of fees are we talking about here? Because localities already have the ability to set zoning permit fees and um, <clears throat> impact fees and um, stuff like that. So what, what are we talking about here? I, I, I don't understand at all. Um, 
I might lean a little bit on Stephanie and Michelle here, but my understanding of bills that there's there, the bill creates certain licenses um, to operate at the state level, mm -hmm. and these are state fees. And so, what the the control board would do would be to charge fees for um, for someone to hold certain licenses. And I can't remember how many or what all the licenses are, um, but these are state fees. They're not local fees. Yeah. The revenue would go to the state and it would fund the cannabis control board. Right. But so what are the local fees that are going to, um, because my understanding is that the, the proposal was that instead of the, the um, taking a, a local options tax or a 2% or however you want to call it, that there would be fees generated that would go to the localities and the estimate was given to be five hundred or six hundred thousand dollars, and I just I don't know what those fees are, where they're coming from, what what they what they mean. And I know that in Massachusetts, for example, that there were um, well, we call them bribes that um, uh, establishments would say would tell towns we'll give you a hundred thousand dollars toward this if you give us. But anyway, so if somebody needs to explain to me what those fees are, where they're going to come from, and what they mean, and how they're going to be raised and distributed. Um, I think, I mean, it might be helpful for Michelle to jump on here, but I think we're, we're sort of comparing the different versions of the bills here. This, this version, the proposal, does not have any, as my understanding, local fees in it, as there were in the House bill. These just have a... I right, think ours would doesn't. be as good as anybody to explain that. Can I jump in? The um, I think both House and Senate versions of the bill have the state fees. Yes. Um, and that's typical. Uh, um, that's not unusual at all. We do that with every license. So I, yeah. I don't think there's a disagreement between the chambers on the state fees. Our bill, um, instead of having the local uh, option, what the Senate called a local option tax um, had local fees. And the difference, one of the differences between the fees and the tax is that the fees are paid by the entity uh, that gets the license, um, whether it's a retail establishment or a cultivator or whatever it is the tax is paid by the consumer. Mm -hmm. um, so they're paid by different people. Um, the other, um, one of the other differences is that fees are, um, are sensitive to the cost of the, of the license effectively. You know, if, the, if, the, if, a, if granting a license results in higher enforcement costs, for example, or what have you, and the different things depending on different kinds of licenses. The fees are supposed to relate to that in sort of a general way. They're not, you know, it's not like a um, uh, bill back or something where it's specific, but they're supposed to have some connection to the cost. And so in the house, we felt that the local fees were a, a more fair way of, um, ensuring that municipalities were not paying out of pocket for this business, that they were being reimbursed for their costs of, of, of uh, this uh, uh, tax and regulate system. Um, and they can be, they can be uh, sort of more tailored for that. The, the, in both cases, uh, uh, um, I just want to make one other point, but in both cases, I think it's really important that the legislature um, come back to approve those fee fees. I don't think the board is going to set the fees. Um, they're going to make a recommendation to the legislature, both for the state fees and for the local fees, if we do them um, to, under this bill, um, to approve what those fees are. So they're not, it's not, um, it's not the same as the fee that, you know, uh, if there's a fee associated with the uh, application for a zoning um, uh, permit or something that may be set by the town. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a different kind of fee that we would, we, the legislature would actually adopt. Um, right. Whether we it's set local it for the state. localities. They don't. Well, both for the local, for the state, for sure, right, right. but no, also I, for the locality. Yep. I, right. Well, I, I get. Can this. I just, just but, 
we would set the fees for the local Yes. We, we would determine what's best for them. Absolutely. And yeah. we would determine what's uh, fair. Jeanette, we would first. determine what's fair. Okay. Yeah. That, that leads us to why the Senate didn't do that. And part of it was at the time that we were dealing with the bill a year and a half ago. Yep. Um, the um, Massachusetts, many communities were setting exorbitant fees, yes. implementation fees that were. Um, you know, make a million dollar donations to the local YMCA and we'll give you a license. Yeah. And so we wanted to avoid that. I don't have an objection to fees that are, uh, you know, estimate the cost of, for example, police protection in the, in the local area when um, there's a crowd there and they're going to have to direct traffic or whatever. But that, that was what we were trying to avoid sure. through the use of local fees. So we wanted to avoid those impact fees. And, um, and we, but, but what I'm hearing from you is that you are in basically in agreement with us. You just set some fees that would. I'm sorry. Reflect uh, you. You were setting fees that on you know, the local government that, that would reflect the cost of to the locals of implementing whatever the cultivator, or the retail, or whatever. Yeah, we ha we had heard some of the same testimony and had some of the same concerns that you had about not letting the municipality just set whatever fee they wanted. Um, so we wanted we made sure the legislature had to adopt them. Okay, Joe, you have a question. I have a suggestion for the vast majority of people watching this YouTube who have never served on appropriations, myself included adding the word license after state in that line and in every other document that we use to communicate would have solved Jeanette's initial question and probably the question of the many people who are trying to figure out what fees. So I'm, I'm gonna suggest that in future documents saying state licensing fees makes that perfectly clear and if we get into a discussion about local options, we can talk about what specifically those might be later on. Just a suggestion. Suggestion. Good point. Jeanette. But I do, but I do think that it is um, a little a naive of us to think that the cost will be bear, borne by the, the establishment and not by the purchaser, because clearly those costs are going to be passed on to the person who's um, the consumer. So it, it doesn't, um, it isn't the, in, in this, this case, it's the, all the cost of all of it that's being um, assessed and being affected. But in the local options, it was only the, the people who are actually purchasing it that were, would have that fee passed on to them. So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, okay, great. Does, does the committee want me to continue? Yeah. Um, so, um, I don't know if it'd be helpful to share the screen at all, but I'm referring here to the tape, the first table in the document that, that I sent along that I was oh, uh, starting to go through. If I might, Graham, you know, the basis um, of your revenue projections is something per ounce or something per product. And I've been of the opinion, um, based upon other states, that Vermont, uh, that the Joint Fiscal Office has repeatedly used very low figures, um, which to me doesn't reflect what I believe will be the true revenue from um, a tax and regulated system. So I want to get that on the table first. I, I think your revenue projections, I mean, I'm willing to, you know, it is what it is, and the joint fiscal sets that, and I obviously am not an economist, but I still think your projections, given what we've seen in other states, are way low in terms of revenue. So I want to make clear that that, you know, from the, at least from the Senate perspective, these numbers um, we feel are extremely low. Um, 
yeah, I mean, we, we, we look at other states when we do our modeling and. Uh, but, but, you know, when I compare this to what the RAND report was talking about in terms of revenue, this is just extremely low. Um, yeah, I'm aware of the RAND report I'm a, and the, the subsequent new report from the Marijuana Policy Project, which uses lots of research from the RAND report. And we took some of the assumptions from those reports and it, those are in our model. Um, I think one of the biggest divergences in, in from the RAND report and what we have in our model and, and sorry, the RAND report and the Marijuana Policy Project um, or the Vincent Sederberg uh, report is the amount of consumption happening um, estimated. And we estimated, I think, pro in the Senate, when we when I did the estimates for the Senate bill, somewhere around six ounces of, of cannabis um, purchase per year. Um, the latest of that Vincent Saderberg report assumed, I think, closer to 11 ounces of cannabis per year. And so that explains the, the math, most of the, the, bit, the big difference between what you're likely seeing in those reports and what we're estimating here. We, the estimates that we're using for consumption um, are based upon three sources of information from other states, from Oregon, from Colorado, um, and Washington. And some Oregon and, and Washington's had average usage of around six ounces. And then we have the report from, from Vincent Saderberg, which is around 11. And so that's brought into the average. So right now, I think the, these estimates assume somewhere around seven and a half ounces per person. And so that may be low, it's totally possible. We know that Vermont has a very, um, very high prevalence of marijuana. So the, the proportion of the population that, that uses <laughs> cannabis is the highest in the country. But then the second part of that equation is how much are they going to be using? And that is what's gonna be driving the size of the market. We Comparing these revenue estimates to what have been received in other states, scaling them by the size of Vermont's population and the excise tax, they put them roughly in line with what other states have received. So um, we, I, I totally will concede that these might be low, but I think if they end up being, if the revenues come in much higher, then it'll you know, be a better situation than overestimating what is available um, for various purposes and then revenues coming in a lot lower, which it has been the case amongst states recently. Massachusetts numbers were missed their projections quite a bit in their first year. California's were less than a tenth of what they estimated in their first year. So um, particularly if there's programs can be built around the funds, the revenues from this tax, it, um, we're, we're trying to be more prudent with, with what we estimate here. Robin Benjamin. Um, I don't remember the timeline here, but would um, on the RAND report in particular, was tax and regulate in place in mass in Maine before or after the RAND report? I think the RAND report was was published before either of those markets came online. The the Vincent Saderberg report, which came out in August, um, that report had the information that Massachusetts was legal and they had a, a functioning market at that point and the Maine was just starting. Um, so they had that information that's built into their model as well. Um, and I think that largely affected some of their traveler estimates. Um, so how many people would come to Vermont and to purchase cannabis products? Um, our model has that too. Um, but the, the big, the biggest difference between our estimates and the estimates from that, from, from Vincent Saderberg are um, the consumption estimate, the how, mu how much people are going to be using. Um, and that drives probably 80% of the revenue difference. Very good, thank you. Jeanette? Did you say Janet or Jeanette? Jeanette. Oh, okay. So um, I, I just, I don't mean to, keep beating this up, but I want to go back one more with one more question since um, we started talking about revenues. So the, as the revenues increase, the, the state benefits by increased revenue because of the excise tax and the sales tax. I mean, it clearly goes up, but the localities don't 
benefit by increased revenue at all because those fees are set once. And then if, if the revenue goes way up, they, they have no ability to benefit by that additional revenue. Is that, do I understand that right? They're just, they, they do not share in the wealth. Janet? Well, the, the concern that we heard from the municipalities is that they were gonna incur costs because of this new market. Yeah. And so our goal was to uh, protect them from those additional costs. It wasn't intended to be a revenue bonus of some kind. Um, the local option towns, the towns that currently have a local option sales tax, that'll float with the, with the uh, retail sales, obviously. And those, those specific towns uh, mm -hmm. will get some benefit. But no, our intention with this was to respond to the concern that we heard from the towns, which is that, um, that they would incur um, expenses and that they um, should have a way to uh, recoup uh, that or be protected from those additional expenses. I, I hear that, but I do uh, the education fund and the prevention fund and the state general fund will all benefit by increased revenues, but the municipalities won't benefit at all by increased revenues. So anyway, that's just a point. Fair enough. Um, so that first table with the green at the top is the total revenues for this, for this, this is the proposal that came forth out of last week's meeting. So it was a 14% excise tax of that 14%, 12% is the state and 2% is local localities plus a 6% sales tax. And then plus what we estimate to be the fee revenue. So this is kind of your all in number here. Um, and so we estimate the revenue wouldn't really start coming online until fiscal 22, that in five, about $500,000. That's the first set of fees from the integrated licenses. Um, and then fiscal year 23 is when the market starts to, to be introduced and, and gets up to speed. So the midpoint estimate for all in revenue is $6.9 million, growing to $14 million in fiscal 24 and $18 million in fiscal 25. Again, that's all in revenue. And there are the revenues get split into into various pots here, but this is sort of the big picture revenue um, for the proposal that came that was that was put forward by the Senate last week. Sc scrolling down a bit, the the first table after that first that initial table with the green headline is what the general fund will receive. So <clears throat> this is seventy percent of the of the excise tax revenue after the 2% is pulled out for the localities. So we estimate that the revenues will, will coincide with when the market, when retail sales start to happen and our estimate is that that will happen in fiscal year 23. So the midpoint estimate for fiscal 23 for the general fund is $2.6 million growing to 5.6 and then um, in fiscal 24 and then $7.4 million in fiscal 25. So this is what the, will be available for the general fund. Um, from this proposal. The table after that shows the education fund revenues. Um, again, you don't start to see revenue until there are retail sales happening, and that's not going to happen, we estimate, until fiscal 23. Um, and the midpoint estimate for that is $1.9 million um, in 23, $4.4 million in fiscal 24, and 5.3 in fiscal 25. Scrolling down to the next table, this is the revenues that the localities will receive from the 2% um, um, tax that is coming off of the 14% state excise tax. So like I said, the previous two tables, there's no, there's no revenue until there are retail sales for the localities. And so fiscal year 23, the localities would receive about $600,000 based upon my midpoint estimate, um, growing to 1.3 in fiscal 1.3 million in fiscal 24, and then 1.8 million dollars in fiscal 25. So, as was discussed previously, as retail, if as the retail market grows, the amount of revenue for localities will grow because it's based upon the, the tax base here. Um, and then finally, the the substance misuse and prevention fund is 30 percent of the excise tax revenue 
after the 2% is taken out for the localities. Um, and so what we, we expect that to, to be is $1.1 million in fiscal 23, 2.4 in fiscal 24, and $3.2 million in fiscal 25. May I ask a question? Yeah, you have a question? Thank you. Um, right so ahead. I'm looking at specifically the substance misuse and prevention fund. Um, and I just haven't done the math in my head. Um, what what are those, if, if we didn't take the 2% out, um, what would those numbers be for say fiscal 23 and 24 on the midpoint? How much, how much money does prevention uh, lose under this? Concept. Oh, good question. I need to. I would have to do the math. I, I, I don't think the math is too hard. It's it's whatever. It's, it's, it's thirty percent of the of the local share. Yeah. So thirty percent of six hundred thousand is um, one hundred eighty one hundred eighty thousand. Yeah. Um. In in. Uh, in twenty three, and then in twenty four, it's. Um, 600,000. Uh, yeah, yeah. Seems like a lot. So, so, the, so one of the things that I'm I just, I, I throw it out there because it, it is a concern. It's a concern of mine. I don't know if it's a concern of others as well, but, um, but by, um, by doing the local share through part of the excise tax rather than through the local fees, it's basically coming at the expense of the prevention fund. Well, uh, to some extent, the general fund and the prevention fund, but it's prevention fund that um, the house has been particularly concerned about. Jeanette, you have a question? No, I was just gonna comment on that and say that um, uh, your the assumption is that the municipalities wouldn't do anything that would use any of their funds to that uh, for purposes that would increase or add to prevention. For example, additional recreation programs, um, boys and girls clubs, that kinds of things. The assumption is that only the state can do prevention, and that those localities would not would not invest any money into that. So uh, I, to be clear, I'm not making that assumption. I don't know how they would spend their money, but what we did in the house is that we earmarked money for prevention because we, we wanted to be sure to uh, control our own decisions as well. Um, I, I have a, another, uh, so I, the house isn't saying no to this idea. We're just trying to understand it better and, and raising some questions about it. Um, I, I don't know when it's appropriate for me to raise a question about how it gets allocated, but at some point I'd like to have a discussion about that. I'll let you, you decide when. So. No, go ahead, Janet. Oh, okay. Um, so the, 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 what I understand about the 2% is the 2% goes into a municipal share pot um, and to, Coin of phrase, and that the um, the money that gets allocated out to municipalities on the basis of some formula, and the question I've got, and I guess it's I guess it's a concern and a question, is um, the two percent is a fixed amount. It's not like the license fees, where if there's more activity, there's more fees. It's just two. It's at two percent, and um, if more money goes to towns that host retailers, less money is available for towns that host uh, cultivation, for example. Um, you know, it's not, um, there, there's not a way of uh, recognizing the additional costs, for example, of cultivators I, coming from towns that probably won't have a retail establishment, but might very likely have a, a grow facility. Um, you know, I have some concern to make sure that that those funds get allocated equitably. And so it's just a concern about how that would get sorted out because um, it's a set amount and what's one type of establishment Hello. generates, the other one is going to lose. Hi, Charity. How are you? Dick, we can uh -huh. hear your conversation. 
<laughs> Nat, go ahead. Thank you for. So, so um, I think Janet that the the thought was that the board would come up with some kind of a formula, so it would be comparable, kind of to the fees, maybe, but it would be based on the um, revenue instead. So they would come up with a formula. So if you had retail establishments, it might be um, a certain amount. If you had a, a cultivators, if you had testing, if you had a wholesale, I think there are six different um, license types or five with another one proposed. And so um, it would, they would come up with some kind of a formula and it isn't that much different than coming up with a formula for setting the fees because it would be based on the type of establishment and how many establishments you had in your town. And so it, it isn't that different. It's just that it's based on the revenue instead of a flat fee. So if the revenue goes up, the town's benefit. Um, and if the revenue goes down, the towns suffer as the same as the general fund would. But there would be a, um, a formula set up, and I believe it says in there that there's some kind of a formula that would um, be set by the board and approved by the legislature as part of the. Um, so it is right. it, the the concept isn't that different from the fees, except that it's based on the revenue. So the there's the potential for it to grow for the municipalities. Um, so that's it. Uh, yeah, I actually think that when you get to the point of setting it, the, the it's quite different from the from the fees. Um, and I'll I'll just throw out an example. If we take that two percent, I can't remember what that. Let's say it's a million dollars, just because I can do it in my head. Um, if that million dollars gets divided up based on population, for example. Oh, or does it get divided up on the basis of the number of acres you have in cultivation? Or does it get divided up on the basis of the number of retail establishments or the size of a retail establishment or whatever? I can just imagine our argument because it's, it's town, you know, the towns are normal, you know, going to see a pot of money and they're going to, each town is going to want its share. Um, I just envision um, arguments that I think would be will be hard to resolve about how it gets allocated, whereas the fee is clearly associated with the activity, and if the activity will generate the fee. So I'm not, again, we're open to looking at it, but I think it's an issue that we should think about a little bit. I think that the thought was that it would be, the formula would be by activity. It would, so it is not, not by that population, easy. yeah. No. Because if you have a little town that has nothing, why would they? So it, it was the thought was that it would be by activity. So um, there might be if you have this type of a license in your town, there's that much associated with it. So I, I think it, it is a question, but I think it's resolvable. And Janet, let me ask you a question. I mean, based on <clears throat> Other local fees are charged. Fees aren't necessarily static. I mean, the Cannabis Control Board could come back at some later date um, and request an adjustment of fees. I assume that they would. I mean, we typically adjust fees all the time. Um, we used to do them every three years for right. fee. It's kind of been a while, but. Yeah. yeah, we used to do them every three years. Um, we should get back on that schedule, by the way. We should. Thank you. Um, but um, that's not my call. I would just like to suggest that the Senate has provided an alternative um, proposal and we're kind of going around in circles here until the House has had the opportunity to provide us with a counter proposal. Okay. And at this point, um, as you know, the Senate has generally supported local option taxes and the House has had difficulty with them, whether it be on cannabis or other ones. So. Um, recognizing all that, I think we're just spinning our wheels here talking further about how the local option and the fees would match. And we would look forward to a counter proposal from the House. Michelle? Hi, I just wanted to uh, remind everybody that 
So in both proposals, uh, whether you're talking about the state fees or these local license fees, the idea was that the board would be coming back to the General Assembly, um, recommending a proposal, and then the General Assembly specifically setting the fees. Now that we're down the road a few months from when this was originally contemplated back in um, early March, um, I provided for you last week kind of a, a general estimated timeline of what things might look like. Um, and uh, so you have to think about the board now that we're down the road probably wouldn't actually get seated and start to function until the beginning of um, calendar year 2021. And so there is, uh, you know, there's some issues um, that we can certainly work out, but around the timeline of making sure that they have enough time to get set up and then do all of these reporting requirements and develop the proposals to come back to you next spring while the legislature is still in session. So I just, it, it, it exists no matter whose proposal you go with, but I just wanted to mention that as something for everybody to kind of keep in mind. Um, so. Thank you, Michelle. Does anybody have any more questions for Graham? But I, I think Dick would like to move on. So um, Stephanie, do you want to review the document that you prepared? Sure. Um, so the, the, the document I prepared is the fund summary. Um, and the, the numbers in this summary sheet um, that you should all have in front of you are, are going to be um, the midpoint range of everything that Graham just went over. So um, anything that's grayed out is sort of older. Um, so at the top of the sheet, I've grayed out the, the this is the tax base um, that Graham updated. Um, we had a tax base, um, he estimated, I don't have it filled in because I didn't have time last week to go back a year and a half and, and fill it in yet. But um, back in, in February, there was an estimate of the mid range of the tax base that's been updated to this August mid range. Um, what the size of the market is estimated to be the $31 million, the 66 growing to 66.8, almost $67 million in 24, and then $87 million um, once it's more mature three years out. Um, and that's the, the basis against which the percentages are, are um, lodged to, to generate the, the revenue and um, estimates. So the first block is the education fund. It, re it represents the 6% sales tax. So this is state education fund revenue. Um, it does not represent um, you know, the various local option taxes that would be out there um, and depending on where, where establishments are, whether or not there would be um, a little bit of additional revenue at the local level. Um, the next block is what we've been talking about is the, the distribution of this 14% um, excise tax. So what this shows just lined up together is that 2% um, of that 14% set aside for the local share. Then for the prevention fund, 30% of the remaining 12% and for the general fund, 70% of the remaining 12%. So, um, that's what you see in the middle box. So if you go down the 23, the FY23 column, you see the, the local share of $600,000 growing if you go out to the right to $1.8 million by 25, um, based on that growth in the market that's, that's projected. The prevention fund in 23, um, having $1.1 million in it, uh, growing to $3.2 million by 25, and then the general fund 2.6, growing to 7.4. Um, so it, based on the mid range of the, of the high, low, medium that, that Graham gave us. Um, and then in that line below, you see the total of all the 20%, the 14% excise tax and the 6% sales tax in total. The caveat um, or the, the piece that, um, we have to be aware of if you scroll down a little bit further into the box that um, is the regulation special fund for the cannabis control board. 
um, where I do have a fee revenue. And as Senator Benning pointed out, it would be much clearer if that said state licensing fee revenue, because that's what it represents is an estimate of state licensing fee revenue. Um, that line has not changed um, since uh, February, although the timing of that line could change. It, um, we haven't changed the estimate of timing just you know because the the early players we assume will still come in under the wire in 22, just much more closer to the end of the year in FY 22. But that could slip um, depending on how things we, you know we're we're further down the calendar now. Um, but that's that five hundred thousand dollars growing to about six hundred and fifty a year on average is is an estimate that's not based on a set a, a slate of fees. It's our sort of mid-range estimate of the likely fees that will come up from the board, but they could be different because um, the board will be presenting to the legislature for the legislature to adopt. So it's a it's a little bit of an unusual fee estimate here that we're carrying. <laughs> um, and then below that is is the estimate of a three-member board operating. Um, and this same construct that we've had in the Senate and in the House, starting in a deficit position for the board in anticipation of fees and having language, and that's the bright green that is on this sheet. Um, and what wasn't clear to me last week um, is how the accumulated deficit in the regulation special fund will be um, addressed out in 23 and 24, depending on what year, you know, we want to sort of true up the, the deficit that we're building in this, in this special fund. Um, so um, I, I think uh, Michelle might have sent something that said it, it is lodged against the general fund portion only. Is that in the Senate's proposal? Um, that's the one thing that wasn't clear to me, and I'm sorry I didn't get to circle back um, with the senators, but by the, this estimate shows that we'd be $1.4 million in deficit with another $300,000 in deficit in 24. So we're lo still looking at something in the high, you know, close to $2 million of deficit um, for the board to get up and running, but we need to actually address that deficit um, concretely from the excise uh, piece. Uh, and I, I don't know if that's um, shared between the local and prevention and general fund, or if it's just lodged on the general fund, um, that's a, sort of the open question. Just as long as the language that's in there to um, satisfy that deficit is there, then this construct of using anticipated revenue is okay to do, as long as we have the, the way to, to bring us into balance <laughs> at some fixed point. Dick, go ahead. Yeah, John. I if you know i don't have any preset notion on how to do that but if that were part of the house's counter proposal back to us that would be fine i would guess that we would use all funds it it should be you know coming out of the 70 percent the two percent that would be my the fairest way to do it but um if you want to look at it and because i hadn't anticipated how we'd pay it back to be honest with you when the Senate made its proposal. Um, okay. I'm open to that. And whether or not the 6% sales tax would be a part of that payback as well. Thank you, Dick. But thanks for catching that, Stephanie. I suppose we have an intention of paying back our bills. A small obsession of mine in this process. <laughs> Unlike the federal <laughs> government. <laughs> Any more questions on this? Joe. You know, as I'm sitting here thinking, these estimates are all based on examining what other states have done. And all of these estimates are going to depend on the existence of a town that has opted into this program. And I don't know whether, um, we have thought about making that connection, but it seems to me a little concerning that without any town presently having agreed to opt in, um, we are making some really speculative statements here. 
And I don't know how to resolve that. I'm just flagging that as an issue that I'm, I'm contemplating and hearing these numbers because it presumes that we have an operating system and we don't have an operating system or a mechanism to get there yet. And I guess I just wanna urge us to keep that in mind going forward in further discussions. Fair point. I would remind everybody that we still have eight, roughly eight that I've counted um, issues between the two sides and the opt in opt out clause is still one, remains one of them. So, um, in our version, Joe, then the opt, you would opt out, not opt in, but still alive. That's all I'm saying is that from our perspective on the Senate side, we still believe there are eight issues outstanding. I think we agree with that, Dick. That there are eight issues. Yes. Thank at you. Least. Well, I worry okay. when you say at least. Well, I have a list of nine, so. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, <laughs> for the time being, we finished with tax um, structure and revenue. Um, I, I thought there would be two more issues we could discuss this morning. Um, one is cultivation. I, I think you wanted a discussion around farming. Um, Michael Grady um, worked with us uh, on that section of the bill um, and is, is the expert on it. Um, and then we'll have a discussion about um, TAC limits, which I can discuss. Mike, can I, do you want to start? I just, and I, um, I can... If you don't mind, John, can I make a few comments before? Sure, you absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple of concerns on the agriculture side. One is um, we believe that the medical program should not stay with public safety and should be moved either to under the Cannabis Control Board or to the Agency of Agriculture. Um, so that, that's our position. And then the, the second concern we have is with the small cultivators. And we realize that if you call it farming, that that opens it up to everything. And there's no zoning, et cetera, the right to farm. But we're concerned about small cultivators, particularly losing their ability to stay in current use. So that's a second issue. If Mike can address that, that would be helpful to us. Um, so those are, we see it, um, uh, that being a key issue for the small cultivator, whether it be 500, I think we've agreed with, with your thousand um, yep. square foot. That's my understanding. Yep. Thank you, John. Mike? Uh, uh, I'm just going to frame out where um, the farming issue is in S54 and in the last proposal that I'm aware of. Uh, when S54 was passed by the Senate, it did not specifically address whether or not cannabis cultivation was farming or not. Uh, when the House took it up in January, uh, I was asked to address that question uh, by House Natural Resources. And I said that uh, because cannabis could be viewed as a horticultural crop uh, and that it is grown in a greenhouse, that it would potentially qualify as farming under the definition of farming uh, under, in, um, in Title VI and under the required agricultural practices. That has consequence because as you know, farming is, um, exempt or receives benefits uh, in the state under statutory law. Senator Sears referenced one of those uh, being municipalities uh, cannot regulate farming for the most part. There are also significant environmental exemptions. There are also significant tax benefits or exemptions. Um, and when the house was looking at that, House Natural Resources was concerned about the environmental exemptions and the land use exemptions. And I believe, and I don't wanna speak for the chair of House Ways and Means, but Ways and Means also had some concerns about the tax consequences 
of, of designating cannabis as farming. So the House then included what is um, Section 869, which provides that cannabis shall not be regulated as farming under the required agricultural practices uh, or other state law um, and won't be considered an, ag an agricultural crop or agricultural product for the purposes of 32 VSA chapter 124, which is use value, 32 VSA 9741, which is the sales tax exemption or other relevant state law. Um, but the Agency of Agriculture was concerned that cannabis that is cultivated outside or in general should meet certain um, minimum agricultural requirements. So there is a subsection in 869 that provides that cannabis cultivation and processing needs to meet some minimum requirements of the required agricultural practices, but that does not mean it is farming. So that, that's really where the um, house proposal on S54 is. The cannabis cultivation would need to meet all relevant federal, state, and local laws. Um, and one of the reasons that the committee, at least House Natural, uh, chose to do it that way, they looked at Washington State, and Washington State uh, has that same regulatory framework where cannabis cultivation doesn't get that exemption as farming and then it has to be regulated as any other business or industry. So looking at current use to answer Senator Sears question for a small cultivator, um, I think you have options. Uh, one of the ways that, well, when land no longer qualifies as uh, for use value, it is designated as development. And there's a long definition of development in the, the current use chapter. And there are certain things that have been designated as not development. Um, and therefore, uh, it doesn't qualify under what is an agricultural land or managed forest land, but it still gets to remain in the program uh, because you've designated it as such. And, and a, an example of that is ecologically sensitive areas. Um, they're allowed to be present on managed forest land up to a certain percentage, even though they're not actually forest land. Um, so th there are ways that, that the current use program has, has addressed things that don't necessarily qualify as agricultural land or managed forest land. So I think if you as this conference committee wanted to do that, I think uh, Anthea, Abby and I could probably work to do that. Janet? Can I, I'm not sure what you're suggesting. Are you saying that if you're enrolled in current use and you withdraw the land, we would, we would say something in the statute to say that that's not development? You're not talking about being able to enroll it. So you're only talking about if it's withdrawn. Well, I, th I think you, you have some considerations to make. You could do it if it's enrolled or withdrawn. For example, uh, agricultural land needs to certify every year that it's agricultural land. And if you look at that definition of agricultural land and, and cannabis is not a farm crop, it's not, a, it's not an agricultural crop, I don't see how agricultural land gets certified every year if it's growing cannabis. Janet? Can I jump back in? So I, I'm not in favor of allowing a cannabis um, uh, cultivation to be enrolled in current use. What I, what I, um, what I think we, meant to do in the house is to say that if you have enrolled agricultural land and you allocate some of it to cannabis, you're not, you, you, keep, your, you keep the rest of your property in current use. You're only withdrawing that small piece. And I think, I think that was our understanding when it left the house, which, you know, these, we're not talking about acres and acres. We're talking about 
a relatively small amount of land, I think. Um, so that that was my understanding when it left the house. I, I, I'm talking about small land, you know, the yeah. smaller, uh, obviously, if it's a huge cultivation effort, that would be different. I'm talking about the small cultivation. Okay. okay. I point so, out that 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 in the Meadowy Valley, anyway, and that's the only farming area I'm really familiar with in my county. In the Meadowy Valley, many people were planting hemp last year, mm -hmm. and this year they're not planting hemp for a variety of reasons. Okay. I would hate to see them be tossed out of current use for having planted hemp or marijuana, and then you know decide next year not to plant it or not to grow, and, you know, they're no longer in current use. I, I, that just troubles me for the smaller plots. Um, and it, I, I'm, I know it's true, you know, I've got a farmer down in the Pownal Valley growing uh, hops for beer. Um, I don't know if he's in current use or not, but it, the point is it's still the same. So if you're, you're not using it for conventional farming, um, we just don't want to see them thrown out of current use. Well, I have a couple of points on that. So hemp is an agricultural crop under state and federal law. Right. Um, so is hops. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then the question is, twenty. what is a small parcel? What you keep saying, the small parcel. What is a small parcel? Because the threshold for one eligibility requirement for ag land is 25 acres or more is is it more is it do you want a small parcel I, I just don't have a context for what you mean by a small parcel well the thousand square foot small cultivator and i can't i don't have the bill in front of me because it's somewhere stuck in montpelier um and I can't get to Montpelier because of COVID. So I would have to look at the bill, but the difference between, you know, there, there would be gradations of cultivators and we've already established that. Um, and it would be the small cultivator, whether it be, you know. Okay. So then if it's less than 25 acres, the, the person that's applying has to be a farmer and has to meet that definition of a farmer right. and it might be difficult for some cannabis people, cultivators to meet that definition of farmer. Some will, especially if they've been cultivating already and they change it over. I just wanna put that out there. So you could say that land that was enrolled previously in current use is not, uh, considered development or, or is not subject to, to removal from the program if it converts to, to cannabis cultivation and still meets the other requirements of chapter 124. That, that's pretty much what we said. So just for everybody's education, a thousand square feet is 0 0.02 acres. So it's actually a very, very small portion of land. But, well, isn't an acre like 43,000 and change square feet? Yeah, we're talking about a really and, tiny. And, and just to jump, I mean, well, I think so. Michelle, just so I that I'm you, clear about this, okay. anybody that's under, under the 25 acre threshold, you're not eligible to be in current use from an agricultural perspective anyway. No, you can qualify. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the ways that you qualify is you have you're a farmer and you generate two thousand dollars of income from that uh, in any one of the past two to three years i can't remember which it is michelle and michael if you would up a proposal for us i think you've heard what we're intending and um we could talk about it during a breakout if you need more information um but we would like to make a proposal. This is our proposal. Um, and much of it comes from Senator Pearson, the vice chair of Senate Ag. So I, you know, you could consult with him as well. 
and we can make a counter proposal, a, a proposal to the house on what exactly we're talking about. And then we have something to go from rather than guessing as to what we're all talking about. Is that fair? Yes. So just to clarify, um, it's land that was already enrolled in use value. Yep. It's converted to cannabis cultivation, provided that it's still underneath. Converted the small, to legal cannabis cultivation. It's it's still it's it has to be under the small cultivator threshold. Um, okay, I think, and it has to meet all of the other requirements of yeah. use value. Yeah. Um, okay. And if you no. wouldn't mind consulting with Senator Pearson on that as well, and we will sure. we'll do a breakout later and try to, if we have time, um, but so develop, I think it's easier to work from proposals and trying to reinvent the wheel here in a conference committee. Michelle? I just wanted to add, I think folks know, but I just wanted to remind everybody. So uh, Senator Sears was right. So the small cultivators is defined as a, th a thousand square feet or less. The Senate um, concurred with that house proposal amendment on that. And then, and you also have a directive for the board to be establishing the tiers for the cultivators. And I can just say, you know, who knows what those will be, but historically over the last five years of this legislation uh, moving around, um, none of the versions, even the ones that have passed the Senate before that had established the various tiers in there and the fees, nothing's been um, even close to 25 acres. So it was all, all everything to date that's been contemplated is, is has been smaller, just an FYI. So. Thank you. John, can we take a five minute break? Sure. Do you want to break out or just break? No, just a break. Sure. That's fine. Thank so you. we should all stop our audio and mute. And so I have it's 10.08. We'll be back at 10.15. Jeanette, are you back? I think you're the only one we don't have. Why don't we start? I'm here. Okay. She's hey, that that would get her attention. I'm here. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so I think we finished with the the, the farming aspect. Uh, I believe the Senate's going to come back with a proposal. Yeah. Good. Um, so the the other issue that you wanted some discussion on that I thought we could discuss today is potency limits. Um, so just to, um, first of all, to, to focus on what we already agreed to in both of our proposals is um, to restrict cannabis products that contain THC and nicotine or alcohol um, in any cannabis product um, that is designed to, to make the product more appealing um, to those under 21. Uh, we both agree to those limits on cannabis. Um, what the house added um, was prohibiting cannabis flower with greater than 30% THC, um, solid concentrate cannabis products with greater than 60% THC, um, cannabis oil products, except those, those sold in prepackaged um, form and for vaping, um, and then flavored oils, cannabis products for vaping and cannabis flower that contain flavors that, not, that are not naturally occurring in cannabis. Um, we also changed the product limits for edible products from the Senate's version of serving size of 10 milligrams um, with a total product content of 100 milligrams to 5 milligram serving size and 50 milligrams um, total product size. Um, so let, let me deal with the simplest one there with respect to flavored oils. Um, I think we're probably all aware of the impact of Juul on tobacco um, vaping. Um, I think our concern there was that adding flavors, unnatural flavors to a cannabis product um, would lead to people 21 and younger um, using that product um, and making it more enticing to those people. Um, so we wanted to make certain um, that flavorings could not be used um, in cannabis products, most typically uh, vaping products. 
Uh, with respect to, to the, the limitation on cannabis flower, um, just you know, so people understand, um, according to the Drug Enforcement Administration, back in 1995, uh, the average THC level was 4% in cannabis flower. Um, that increased to about 12% in 2014, um, and potency limits um, in 19 have gone up to about 17.1. Um, in the legal market um, in Colorado, um, THC limits for a flower are about 30%. Um, the proposal here is that, as you can see from that sort of timeline, um, the potency of THC flower, the, the potency of flower has increased dramatically. And with it, um, there's more danger. And the other thing that happens when you increase the potency, the THC content, the amount of CBD in that flower goes down dramatically. Um, CBD um, can be, uh, uh, have beneficial effects to reduce potential um, negative impacts of THC. So what we propose is that there be a limit on flour of 30% THC. This would basically hold the market at what currently can be produced um, and not increase it to higher and higher levels where there are more dangers around um, using um, cannabis products. Um, and, and that's, I can go more into the science of that if you want, but that was the basic reason for the 30% the limit on flour. Um, with respect to solid concentrates, um, Currently, um, there are products um, who have street names like Wax and Shatter, um, which are highly concentrated uh, forms of cannabis. Um, basically, they are synth synthesized products that are melted down um, and can be 80 to 90% THC concentrates. Um, we heard testimony in House GovOps that if somebody who has never smoked cannabis before was to smoke uh, or, or dab, as they call it, um, wax or shatter, um, they would, that they would be on the floor. Um, so these are very highly concentrated and potentially dangerous products. Um, and so what we wanted to do is put a limit on how concentrated they could be at 60%. Yeah, well, well, we did too, right? What? We have limits as well. Not on concentrates. So what we wanted to do is just because those products um, can be very dangerous. It's very easy, uh, especially for a new, new user of cannabis um, to be overwhelmed by that type of a product. Um, so we thought putting a cap on the concentration at 60% um, would be important to protecting consumers. Um, there's a number of side effects from high, highly concentrated um, cannabis products with highly amounts of THC. And so we were just focusing on that. And I'd be glad to share the research that's out there with respect to that. I, I just, you know, I'm looking at our version on the side by side versus your version. I don't see that much difference. You have a, we have a package cannabis product may not contain more than 100 mg of THC. Um, you have 50, um, you That's have, correct. uh, cannabis products must, we had cannabis products must be lab labeled in a manner which states the number of servings of Delta nine in the product measured in servings of maximum of 10 milligrams. You went to, um, five milligrams. Right. Um, so <laughs> I think that's what we should really be discussing. I, I, I don't know where all this. Um, you you put in prohibited products. We said contain nicotine or al alcoholic beverages. Right. right. Um, we put in all that. So you just added to what we did and built on it, I guess. Yes, that is exactly what we did, is we put limits on the percentage of THC in flour and limits on the percentage of THC in concentrates, and we reduced the size of edible products. So um, we're all in the same range. We are. And, and so I just wanted to explain I, to you. I, I just, yeah, I understand that, John, but you act like we, we were from the Neanderthal world. Absolutely not, we, Senator. We had, we had, uh, we had our um, 
you know, we had our discussions about this issue and the safety of the product, which is one of the reasons for having this, you know, a, a tax and regulated system is the safety of the product. So um, I, I don't know um, what the difference is between five milligrams and 10 milligrams per serving, but um, I guess it's half. So let me explain. I have not yet explained that difference. And the, the, the main difference, with the, the problem with edible products, unlike if you're smoking flour, um, is that the, the, your response or your reaction from cannabis um, can take an hour or more to actually um, to feel the impact of the THC on your body, Yeah, we've um, heard that which thing. can lead Absolutely. people to to continue to eat edibles and therefore potentially overdose or take more than, than is safe for them. And so we just, in an abundance of caution, reduce the limits so that there's less chance that people, especially children, are gonna get their hands on um, a product um, where they could have symptoms that are, are dangerous. <coughs> Yeah, yeah. And, and we, well, we're, we're in the same um, boat here. It's just that I would think that, you know, somebody might eat two servings of five milligrams and then be at 10 milligrams. Am I not? Am I correct? That is a possibility. I mean, we can't there's... control what somebody eats when they buy a edible product. They may eat two servings. I, I, I know the other day when I was cooking something and my wife and I were doing four servings, and I thought, wow, that's awful small if I did just two servings. Yes, but there's less chance of running into problems with lower. Well, stuff. I was talking about, um, you know, stove stop stuffing, not ah. marijuana, but um, seriously, um, you know, we can't control the, we can do our best. I think the important point is down below where we, um, we each, uh, you have health warnings developed by Department of Health and adopted by the board, and we had warnings concerning the potential risk of consuming, consuming cannabis and need to keep product away from persons under 21, as well as any other adopted through the rulemaking of the board. Again, different ways to state the same issue. Yes, Jeanette. Um, so <clears throat> I'm, I'm looking at the, um, the part about the packaged cannabis products is is the assumption that the the way they're packaged is per serving so that a packaged um <clears throat> i mean you 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 could buy five servings but the 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 packaged product assumes that's one serving is that what yeah i think the okay. easiest the easiest way to think of this is uh, is your typical chocolate bar which, as we know, cannabis-infused chocolate bars are, are sold um, in the regulated market. And so you would have a, a cannabis, you know, chocolate bar that would have five milligram servings, so little chunks that are of five milligrams, and then the total bar would be 50 milligrams. Because the assumption that is sense? that the assumption is that the bar itself is one serving. Well, no. think of a Hershey's bar, and it's got four things. So you would each one of those little chunks would be five under your perversion, and ours would be ten. That's um, correct. So Thanks. you would have you would buy four, but you're urged to only eat one. So I, I guess my <clears throat> the my difficulty here is that the packaged product is not considered one serving. So you could, you're saying that a packaged product could have no more than five servings, single servings. And the way ours said is that a packaged product could have up to 10 servings. No, it, it could have 10 servings. Five per oh, serving 10, ours, versus okay. five milligrams per serving. So all we're arguing about is, okay. I, is I just how need... much is in the serving. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah, you got it. And the That's... same true of the 100 mg of THC, unless it's topical preparation, 
we had 100, they have 50. Yeah. But that's I, the, the The key difference is the serving size. Okay, right. thank you. Michelle? I just wanted to also to, to mention that in both versions, the maximum amount uh, per transaction for purchasing uh, is an ounce. So it's the same amount of product in both versions. It's just how the, the uh, infused products are divided up with respect to the, the, the package product and then how many per servings per package product. What do other states do, Michelle? With regard to the amounts, I'm not sure. I can take a look. Could you, could you take a sure. look at both the THC um, and the uh, um, edible? Yep. And what other states who regulated do, please? Sure. So I can at least tell you based on my research, but you can rely on Michelle's is that, you know, serving sizes are limited. Um, most states um, do not limit potency. Um, though Illinois, which I believe is the last state to regulate adult use cannabis, um, has allowed their cannabis control board to limit potency by rule. Yeah, we both agree that potency should be limited. The question is what level right so i think those are the areas we're prepared to discuss i mean if there's any other questions um, that the senators have at this point um yeah have we settled the advertising we have not that's still an open issue have you looked at the um possible constitutional issues surrounding? Yes, I have. So while there is not a lot of case law out there with respect to um, cannabis advertising, um, there are a mix of cases, um, which um, at least one case in Montana has upheld a prohibition on all cannabis advertising. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are there's also a case in Colorado, which has raised questions about um, limiting the audience, um, the underage audience, um, that that might be um, unconstitutional. So while there is not a lot of case law out there, I think it is potential that the advertising regulations in the Senate version, in the House go Government Operations version, as well as the House passed version, which is the prohibition, all could face constitutional challenges. Well, we have offered you your version from House Government Ops. Yes, I know that. I, I am just telling you my understanding of the case law that's okay. out there. I understood, but I, I just wanted to, wondered if you had made a decision to accept your version. No, we haven't. Jan Janet? Well. I know you know this, but I'm going to say it anyway. The House version isn't the GovOps version. Um, and we're here in the conference committee. We're defending what the House voted for, at least as a starting place. Uh, I think I understand that. Yeah. I know you Thank understand you. that. <laughs> um, but I do want, I do. Um, anyway. Um, so. Probably ought to set a date for a next meeting and next Monday is Labor Day. So I doubt we want to meet on Labor Day. That's, that's true. Um, so. Yeah. I don't know, we can't go anywhere, so. <laughs> well, but. Do we want to meet sooner? I um, don't want to ask the um, staff to commit on I know. Labor Day. Yeah, staff, I, staff has a day off. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, thank you for reminding us, Peggy. <laughs> Thank you for looking out for us, Senator Sears. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I, it's hard to put together anything given our schedules. Um, I mean, I hate to put it off to the 14th, but mm -hmm. um, I don't. 
I think that would be risky to put it that far off. Well, we are already at September 1st. We um, could do it early in the morning or late afternoon. Um, how about, you know, what time? We go on the floor at 9.30 on Tuesdays. I'm looking at the 8th, possibly. Oh, okay. I, you know, looking at our schedule on the house side for this week, um, we could probably do it, but I think to find a three hour block would be the challenge. If yeah. we could maybe get together a shorter duration and maybe meet more than yeah. once if we needed to, but the three hour block is gonna to be tough. Yep. I don't know that we need three hours. It's all, it's 1030 now. Right. Um, well, can uh, we meet on Tuesday the 8th at 8 a.m.? Um, my committee is, has a meeting at 8.30 on- Okay. Well, I don't, our, our meeting times get assigned. Um, this okay. week it's 8.30, so- Yeah. I'm quite sure when it's gonna be. Um, I mean, if we could meet this week, I mean, we know what our mm -hmm. committee times are. Friday morning. I have an 8.30, committee is at 8.30 on Friday. Uh, the problem is I don't actually know if I can adjust it and I don't I don't know exactly what I'm planning to do, but that's my allotted time. So I probably should keep it. Yeah, we're Late meeting afternoon. at 9.30 to 11.30 on yeah. Friday. And then I know I have appropriations in the afternoon and I, I could meet later after, you know, I could meet by three o'clock on Friday. Uh, house we, boards from two to four, but if we happen to get done early, I'm fine Friday afternoon. Why don't we try that? Is that okay with you, Rob? Yeah. Yeah. I don't okay. think Michelle oh. likes it. Oh. I'm sorry. That is, I have, I'm not available um, at that time. Well, it's the only time we're available, I guess. Um, I can't do Thursday afternoon. I can't do Tuesday, Wednesday or Tuesday. So, um, can, um, Somebody fill in for you, Michelle? Um, I can see, um, or I can see whether or not I can change my schedule. Well, I guess it depends on roughly what the agenda would be. If we're gonna talk, talk more about the tax structure than maybe Michelle. Well at what point do you, are you going to have a counter proposal to us? We can talk about farming with Michael Brady if we can do a breakout after we close this session and give you something back on um, on that if we could meet with Mike and, and Michelle yeah. for a few minutes. Uh, I um, think but that... what will you have something back for us? Because we're kind of spinning our wheels right now. I believe we can have a counter proposal to you. Friday okay. afternoon. So we're agreeing on three o'clock Friday? Yes. It's this Friday, right? The fourth? Yeah, the fourth. Yes, this, this Friday, three to four. Can we say three to four thirty just in case, John? Sure, that's fine, Dick. If we get held up on the floor, we'll just have to. Yeah, then we can go from three thirty to four thirty. Day of the week is that? Oh, it's the fifth. Um, it Friday. is the. It is Friday, September fourth. Right. Sounds good. So, Dick, did you want to do a breakout? Um, with uh, this I'd guy? like to do a breakout with Michael yeah. Grady and Michelle, if we could, and that. Committee, uh, Senate committee. Um, is there anything besides that that you want to discuss at this point? Well, so we've got Stephanie's online, Anthea's online. I don't know. I don't, there is nothing else that I wanted to discuss this morning. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. Are you looking for us to have a breakout, John, or not? Yeah, I think we should have a brief breakout. Okay. So 
Um, can uh, so Andrea can Anthea be in the breakout with O'Grady and me with the senators, please? Um, Abby's coming back as well. Oh, great, fabulous. So we need somebody. Abby, yeah, Michelle. Uh, I can go with you. How can I go with the house then? Is that okay? Because if yeah, you guys are going to be talking about the farming, or are you going to be talking about the taxes as well? No, we're okay. going to be talking about farming and um, my small garden. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, I would really like a chance to talk about uh, taxes in our breakout. Yeah, you can take the them. tax people too. Yeah. We're not going to talk taxes. So. Um, Have you got some cannabis in your small garden, Dick? Not yet. <laughs> is your garden in current use? <laughs> it is not. <laughs> Good. So um, maybe Abby. Well, I don't. I don't know what to I, do. So the money people can decide how to divvy up um, between the two. Representative right Ansel, how about I go with you guys to start, and Abby goes with the current use side since she knows a lot more about that, and I can loop Abby in if <laughs> uh, there's something. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And I'll go wherever. <laughs> okay. uh, with the house. So. Pardon? With the house, I think. Okay. You're going to start with the house, Michelle. OK. If you, right. um, so we need to mute and stop video, right? Oh, gosh. Yeah. How long do you want the breakout rooms to last? Are we coming back, or are we just going to go home after that? Or I am home. We're going to go home after this. We're gonna. I don't know. If there's any point in coming back. We set our next meeting, and uh, yeah. I would. I agree. I think once we're done our we're done we're breakouts, done. we're done. Good. That would be my. Yep. Hey, so we mute and stop, and then we automatically get swapped over. Is that how this works? Yes, that's right. Okay. Yep.